Hello, I'm Dr. DeBellis, and today I'd like to talk to you about hormones and how they exert their influence upon the brain. So for humans, leprosy, scarlet fever, black water fever, dengue fever, malnourishment, these are uncommon causes of death in the United States. Um, now in the 1900s, pneumonia, tuberculosis, and influenza were the most common causes of death. Or if, if you were a risk taker uh, bearing a child because uh, fatalities during delivery uh, were much more common. Um, but today we have much different um, leading causes of death. It seems like heart disease, cancer, cerebrovascular disease, and stroke are the most prevalent. But we find that this is not the case when we're looking at many animals. These are actually quite uncommon. So for human beings, it seems like our, our longevity is determined by uh, a different set of forces and conditions. So one of the questions is, why is this? Why is this disparity? Today we're going to talk about hormones. Hormones are chemicals that are secreted by endocrine glands, which are conveyed by the bloodstream and regulate target tissues. Um, so now endocrine glands release hormones that promote growth, proliferation, and differentiation and modulate cell activity within the body. Um, I'm going to quote Robert Sapolsky here. I really like his description, description of homeostasis, that there is a single optimal level, number, and amount for any given measure in the body you reach that ideal set point through some local regulatory mechanism. And for instance, if there's a water shortage, your body homeostatic solution, as the kidneys are the ones that figure this out, tighten things up, produce less urine for water conservation. Now this is different from this newer idea that we have of allostasis. Allostasis recognizes that any given set point can be regulated in a zillion different ways, each with its own consequences. Or uh, suppose there's a water shortage in your body. The allostatic solution is uh, the brain figures this out, tells the kidneys to do their thing, and sends signals to withdraw from water from parts of your body where it easily evaporates, makes you feel thirsty. They're all different routes, right? It's kind of like uh, if there's a water shortage in your neighborhood, there are all sorts of things that you can do, whether uh, you wash your automobile less often or wash your clothes less often or whether you re-landscape your front yard with, with um, uh, plants that consume less, less water. Um, so this idea of allostasis has come to sort of replace the idea of homeostasis. So when we talk about the endocrine system, we're going to talk about different glands. We're going to talk about the hypothalamus, which plays a, uh, an important role in the control of hormone secretions, as well as the pineal gland, which exerts its effect um, in reproductive maturation and body rhythms. We're going to really focus a lot on the anterior and posterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary um, it controls hormone secretions by the thyroid, the adrenal cortex, the gonads. Um, and the posterior pituitary um, is important for water balance, salt balance. It's also important for the release of certain um, hormones that are important for bonding and childbearing. Um, we're also going to talk about the thyroid, which uh, plays a, a key role in growth and development, as well as metabolic rate. And this is important for psychologists to be aware of because oftentimes thyroid dysfunction can mimic certain psychological conditions such as depression and anxiety. We're also going to talk about the adrenal glands, the outer bark, the adrenal cortex, which is important for salt and carbohydrate metabolism, as well as inflammatory reactions. And then finally, the inner Adrenal medulla is important for emotional arousal. We'll be talking about this topic throughout my lectures. We're also going to talk about the pancreas, which is important for sugar metabolism, the gut, which is important for digestion and appetite control. It has a 
a key role in, in how we feel, actually. We talked about how serotonin, 90% of serotonin is actually in the gut. So um, you can probably see what an impact um, the, the gut has on, on the way that we feel emotionally. And then finally, the gonads, which play a key role in body development and the maintenance of reproductive organs in adults. There are different types of chemical communication in the body, and I'd like to talk about these. Uh, I divide these into the non-social and the social chemical communication. The non-social includes synaptic, which we've talked about a great deal in my previous lectures. We also have the hormonal, which we're going to talk about, um, then autocrine and paracrine, which we'll also talk about. And the social chemical communication includes pheromones, allomones, and chiromones. So the non-social chemical communication is what we're going to start with, and this is synaptic, which you're familiar with. Synaptic communication involves chemical release and diffusion across a synapse. So you can see the neurotransmitter travels from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic membrane where it causes action or great, it causes graded potentials. Now, endocrine communication is communication in which a hormone's released into the bloodstream, which acts as sort of a, a makeshift synapse. Larger, albeit, but um, the hormone's released into the bloodstream, and then it acts upon a target tissue that's downstream. Um, another type of non-social communication is autocrine. It's when a released chemical acts on the releasing cell. So it goes back to the presynaptic membrane and then it activates. And this will actually impact the rate at which that neurotransmitter is released in the future. We also have paracrine communication. That's when the released chemical diffuses to nearby target cells. And there we have it hitting uh, a nearby target cell. Now we also have social chemical communication. For instance, we have pheromones. Pheromones are released into the environment to communicate between individuals of the same species. So maybe if uh, dogs are sniffing telephone poles, they're, it's a form of communication. They're picking up scents. They're figuring out what was going on. We also have allomones. Allomones are released into the environment by one species to affect the behavior of another species. So a great example of this would be a skunk. Um, and allomones benefit the releaser. So the, the skunk releases uh, its scent, which then deters predators from entering the region. It's very similar to what we're going to call chiromones. Chiromones are released into the environment by one species to affect the behavior of another species in a way that benefits the receiver. For instance, we have certain types of, of um, trees that if they're being attacked by predatory beetles, they will actually release um, scents, chiromones, into the, into the environment that attract um, other predators. Um, these will actually benefit those additional predators, sometimes to the exclusion of the initial predators. We have nine general principles of hormone actions. First, hormones act in a gradual fashion. Um, second, hormones act by changing the probability behavior will occur. The third principle of hormone actions is that the relationship between behavior and hormones is reciprocal. Um, and then the fourth is a hormone may have multiple effects, and one behavior can be affected by several hormones. The fifth principle is that hormones often have a pulsatile secretion when they, they occur in pulses. Um, the sixth is that some hormones are controlled by circadian clocks. The seventh principle is that hormones can interact with other hormones and change their effects. The eighth is across species, hormone structure is similar, but functions can vary. 
And finally, our ninth principle is that hormones can only affect cells with a receptor protein for that hormone, which is akin to what we learned earlier about uh, you know, neurotransmitters can only exert their effects on receptors that are a perfect match for their shape. Now, you probably see a lot of resemblance between synaptic communication and hormonal communication, but we also have differences as well. So both neurotransmitters and hormones can bind to receptors and activate second messengers, which brings about changes in cellular function. So we have neurosecretory cells, also called neuroendocrine cells, and they're neurons that release hormones into the blood. So we have one down there at the bottom. Um, and then we have neuropeptides, which can act as neuromodulators, and they alter sensitivity to transmitters. So neural and com hormonal communication differ in five ways. Neural communication travels to precise def destinations, where um, neural messages, also they're rapid, as opposed to hormonal messages, which are slower. Um, synaptic distance is smaller. Um, than in the bloodstream. Another difference is that neural messages are digital sequences of all or none potentials, whereas hormonal messages are analog or graded in strength. Kind of like the graded potential we talked about versus the action potential. And then finally, neural communications are sometimes under voluntary control, whereas endocrine uh, communication is, is less voluntary. We have three types of hormones we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about peptide hormones, we're going to talk about amine hormones, and steroid hormones. The peptide hormones are the longest, they're most common, and they're comprised of a string of amino acids, such as adrenocorticotropic hormone will be an example that we're going to discuss in more detail. We also have amine hormones, such as thyroxine, which uh, it is going to exert its effect with the thyroid gland. Um, and these are modified amino acids, these amine hormones. Um, so they're also called monoamine hormones. And then we're also going to talk about steroid hormones, which are different than, than the neurotransmitters that we've been talking about. Um, an example of this would be a cortisone, which it has uh, four rings of carbon atoms. Um, so hormones don't typically bind to specific ionotropic receptors on the surface of a cell. So there we have a hormone. It doesn't hit that ionotropic, that quick-acting ionotropic receptor. Unlike uh, um, neurotransmitters, hormones don't bind to ionotropic receptors. Um, one of the receptors they do bind to um, Protein and amine hormones bind to specific metabotropic receptors on the surface of the cell and cause the release of a second messenger in the cell. So we can see that the, the ligand hits the receptor, a G protein is then released, and the G protein travels in the intracellular space until it finds a receptor on one of these membrane channels and it activates it and it opens. Then an ion is allowed to enter the, into the intracellular space, whether it's a cation or an anion. I didn't specify. Um, that's why that glow is, is white. If, it's, if the um, ions cause a depolarization, I'm going to make the, this glow effect here red. Um, if they cause hyperpolarization, we'll have a bluish glow effect. So ions go into the intracellular space. This is different than steroid hormones in, in the way that, that it, it behaves. Steroid hormones actually pass through the cellular membrane. They just pass right through it. Um, and then they bind to steroid receptors inside the cell, which then travel to bind to DNA and they actually act as transcription factors, controlling gene expression. Now I want to talk about negative feedback loops. Negative feedback loops are, in general, sort of the, the, the plan for how 
hormones regulate their release. Um, so hormones are regulated by the negative feedback system, which operates when output feeds back and inhibits further secretion. And this is akin to a thermostat. You're all familiar with how a thermostat works, right? It gets cold and the thermostat supplies heat. So these red circles are heat. Heat is generated by the thermostat. It diffuses down its concentration gradient from the hottest corner of the, the apartment to the coolest. It makes its way, and at some point it actually hits a sensor. And the heat triggers the sensor, and whenever it triggers the sensor, the sensor actually turns off the heat generator. It inhibits further heat production. Um, this is how autocrine feedback works. Autocrine feedback um, is when a released chemical acts on the releasing cell by inhibiting the likelihood of further release. So here we can see our vesicles of red neurotransmitter molecules. One of the vesicles is actually releasing its contents into the, to the synapse and it's going to travel down its concentration gradient until it actually goes back and activates these autocrine receptors on the presynaptic membrane. And we have this, this blue glow effect, uh, which actually indicates this is an inhibitory potential here. What happens is whenever these, these, um, these neuromodulatory autocrine receptors, whenever they are activated, it stops additional release of the neurotransmitter. So it shuts itself off, kind of like the thermostat does. Now in target cell feedback, the hormone acts on its target cells and has a biological effect because target cells have the appropriate receptors. And the biological effect is detected by the endocrine gland and inhibits further release. For instance, if we're hungry, we'll eat. And glucose from the food enters the bloodstream, causing insulin to be released from the pancreas. The insulin causes the glucose to be stored in bodily tissues as well as in the liver. As a consequence, glucose levels in the bloodstream fall. And this actually triggers the release of glucagon to be released from the pancreas. Glucagon then converted to glucose by the liver, and it's released in the bloodstream, raising blood glucose levels. So um, a more complex endocrine system, the brain regulation system, involves the brain, usually the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus can direct hormone release. So the brain detects the hormone's effect and exerts a negative feedback onto the hypothalamus. We talk about this brain regulation uh, system. Um, typically, we're talking about the pituitary gland, which releases important hormones. Now, the pituitary gland, which we talked about in, in chapter two when we talked about neuroanatomy, it's positioned below the um, thalamus, and it's comprised of two parts. There's the anterior pituitary, which releases many different releasing hormones. Um, and then we also have the posterior pituitary. And whenever the posterior pituitary releases hormones, it typically releases two. And those are going to be oxytocin and vasopressin, which we're going to talk about in more detail. So the hypothalamus synthesizes and releases hormones, such as vasopressin and oxytocin, into the bloodstream. And it travels through the bloodstream until it reaches target receptors in the bloodstream. Now, when vasopressin reaches the kidneys, it causes them to reabsorb solute-free water and returns it to the circulation, which then increases blood pressure. Um, so vasopressin, again, it's a posterior pituitary hormone, increases blood pressure, it inhibits urine formation, and it affects mating behavior or sex behavior. Um, for instance, we're going to talk about the voles and how you have two different types of voles. 
and uh, one vole is polygamous, the other is monogamous, um, and it seems like the behavior is regulated by vasopressin receptors. But vasopressin and oxytocin can also serve as neurotransmitters in the hypothalamus, so these hormones play a role in social behavior. We're also going to talk about oxytocin, which is the other posterior pituitary hormone, but oxytocin is released during nursing interaction and during orgasm in females. It promotes pair bonds. But vasopressin studied more in, in males, particularly these prairie voles, which have received a, a great deal of acclaim for um, their interesting behaviors. Um, but it facilitates the formation of pair bonds with females. Okay, oxytocin also has a reputation for increasing generosity in the in-group. Um, I have a link there. This is a really interesting video by Robert Sapolsky, which is um, describing um, some uh, research that's up in, in the Netherlands where they actually found that oxytocin increases generosity uh, whenever a, a, a nasal application of oxytocin is actually given. Unfortunately, it seems like it's preferential toward um, generosity in the in-group. So it seems like there's sort of a hidden dark side to oxytocin. So these are vasopressin receptors. We find that the vasopressin receptor density is associated with uh, whether a, a species of vole is actually monogamous or polygamous. Um, the prairie voles are actually monogamous. The males tend to mate with the same partner for most of their life. Um, but the um, mountain vole is actually polygamous. We find that they tend to prefer as many partners as they can have. And what, if we do an investigation at their uh, vasopressin receptor level, we find that there's a, a denser um, uh, collection of these receptors in one species than there is another, which is a you know, biopsychological explanation for why they might behave differently depending on which species it is. So again, oxytocin is involved in reproductive and parenting behavior, also in the uterine contraction, the milk letdown reflex. You're probably familiar. There's a synthetic version of this py pytocin, uh, which is um, uh, used to um, to initiate contractions during delivery. Um, but in this particular feedback loop, so the sensation of the baby leads to a hypothalamic release of oxytocin. And the oxytocin will tell the mammary gland to release milk. And this is how oxytocin exerts its effect upon uh, nursing mothers. A nasal preparation of oxytocin is also being studied as a treatment for many conditions, including uh, autistic spectrum disorders, where sometimes it seems like emotional bonding isn't as strong as it would be in controls. So the anterior pituitary gland may also be involved in releasing and hormone, uh, entropic hormones. So here we're going to switch gears. We're going to talk about the anterior pituitary. We just talked about the post posterior pituitary, which is involved in oxytocin and vasopressin production. Now we're going to talk about the anterior. So we have releasing hormones and tropic hormones. They're used, uh, releasing hormones are used by the hypothalamus to control the pituitary release of tropic hormones, whereas tropic hormones are pituitary hormones that affect other endocrine glands. Um, so the two parts of the pituitary gland are separate in function. The pituitary stalk connects the pituitary to the hypothalamus. And uh, the stalk contains blood vessels, and many axons, which only extend to the posterior pituitary. Here are the hypothalamic neurons that synthesize the releasing hormones. We have uh, the median eminence there as well. Um, this is where the axons converge above the pituitary stalk. And then we have uh, blood vessels. Uh, we have the hypophyseal artery in red and the hypophyseal veins in blue. But 
Releasing hormones are secreted into blood via the hypophyseal portal system. And uh, this is an area where the blood-brain barrier is not particularly strong, and this allows for this transfer so that um, these hormones are able to easily enter the bloodstream and make their way into um, throughout the body. Um, sometimes you'll hear these uh, hear of these described as periventricular organs, meaning that um, these are areas where the blood-brain barrier is not that pronounced. This was noticed some time ago when it was noticed that if you actually inject dye into the body of an animal, that the animal will, the, 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 their whole body will actually change colors inside, except the brain. It seems like the blood brain barrier has this really, really tight layer of endothelial cells that actually prevents many foreign substances from passing in. So, what what was noticed, there are certain areas, like for the human, uh, for human beings, we have the area postrema that's down by the cerebellum, but we have some areas in the brain where we have a um, weaker blood-brain barrier that permits for this transfer, and uh, this hypophyseal portal system is actually one of those. So releasing hormones are carried to the anterior pituitary, which then releases tropic hormones, and the hypothalamus is influenced by circulating messages such as uh, other um, hormones and synaptic inputs from other brain areas. So my acronym for remembering the anterior pituitary um, tropic hormones is PT flag. <laughs> if that helps you, um, go for it. I think you can make some other acronyms that, that might be useful to remember these. So we have ACTH, which is adrenocorticotropic hormone, and it controls ad the adrenal cortex and steroid hormone release. Another anterior pituitary um, hormone is going to be thyroid stimulating hormone, and it increases thyroid hormone release. Uh, we also have follicle stimulating hormone, which stimulates egg containing follicles or sperm production. We have luteinizing hormone, which stimulates follicles from the corpora lutea. We have prolactin, which stimulates lactation in females and is involved in parental behavior. And then finally, growth hormone, which influences growth, mostly during sleep. Um, and the stomach hormone, ghrelin, also evokes growth hormone release. So I want you to remember this acronym, RTG. What do you think it means? Ready to go, rating, rubber tire gantry, real-time golf, real-time gangster, road to glory. It doesn't matter. Whatever it means to you, um, just remember those three letters because we can remember the order of the different hormones by remembering releasing hormones, precede tropic hormones, which precede glandular secretions. So that's what RTG is going to be, releasing hormones, tropic hormones, and glandular secretions. So hopefully you are now ready to go as we try to make our way through this rough terrain of all these different hormones, where they come from, where they're going to, and what's their role in human behavior. So hopefully that acronym will be beneficial for you. So for releasing hormones, hypothalamic neurons synthesize releasing hormones. And these axons converge on the median eminence, which we were talking about, which is above the pituitary stalk, and they release horm and the releasing hormones are secreted into the blood via the hypophyseal portal system. Now Releasing hormones trigger the release of tropic hormones from the pituitary gland. And these tropic hormones travel to glands in the body where they trigger the release of glandular secretions. First, we're going to talk about adrenal hormones. Corticotropin releasing hormone is released by the hypothalamus. Corticotropin-releasing hormone then triggers 
the release of adrenocorticotropic hormone from the pituitary gland. That's going to be up here in the anterior pituitary. And then adrenocorticotropic hormone travels to the adrenal cortex, where it triggers the release of corticosteroids. The adrenal glands are located on the top of each kidney, and they secrete hormones. In mammals, the outer 80% of the gland is the adrenal cortex, and the core 20% is the adrenal medulla. The adrenal cortex secretes steroid hormones called adrenocorticoids. adrenocorticoids. We have the glucocorticoids, which are involved in glucose metabolism. Um, we also have cortisol, which is a glucocorticoid stress hormone that increases blood glucose and breaks down protein. The adrenal medulla releases amine hormones. Um, these are going to be epinephrine, which is also called adrenaline, and norepinephrine, also called noradrenaline. And these are controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. They're sort of the, uh, the, the drivetrain of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, in order to help you remember this, um, the, the adrenal hormones um, are involved in the three S's, salt, sugar, and sex, whereas the glucocorticoids are inv involved in, in um, glucose control, stress, and immunity. The mineral corticoids are involved in fluid electrolyte balance and blood pressure regulation, while the androgens um, are important for sex drive and sex, sex feature development. But the mineral corticoids are adrenal steroids that affect ion concentrations in tissues, uh, like aldosterone, which acts on the kidneys to retain sodium, whereas sex steroids, such as androstenedione, dione, are steroids that are produced in the adrenal cortex, which regulate hair growth. Now that we've talked about adrenal hormones, I'd like to talk about thyroid hormones. So, thyrotropin-releasing hormones released by the hypothalamus. Um, now, thyroid thyrotropin releasing hormones triggers the release of thyroid stimulating hormone from the pituitary gland and thyroid stimulating hormone travels to the adrenal cortex where it triggers the release of thyroid hormones. So the thyroid gland produces thyroid hormones and thyroid stimulating hormone is secreted by the pituitary and its release is controlled by negative feedback from blood vessels and by thyrotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. Thyroid hormones contain iodine and depend on its supply. Um, this condition over on the right, um, the enlargement on, on this individual's neck is a goiter. Goiter is a swelling in the thyroid gland resulting from iodine deficiency. Um, an early thyroid deficiency can result in cretinism or congenital hypothyroidism as well as MR. Now gonadotropin releasing hormone and gonadotropin inhibiting hormone are released by the, the hypothalamus. Gonadotropin releasing hormone and gonadotropin inhibiting hormone trigger the release of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone from the pituitary gland. Um, and luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone uh, travel to the testes or ovaries where they trigger the release of androgens or estrogen. We're going to talk about prolactin. Prolactin releasing hormone and prolactin inhibiting hormone are released by the hypothalamus. Prolactin releasing hormone and prolactin hormone trigger the release of prolactin from the pituitary gland. And uh, prolactin travels to the mammary glands in the breasts where it triggers milk production. Growth hormone. Um, somatocrinin and somatostatin are released by the hypothalamus and somatocrinin and somatostatin trigger the release of growth hormone from the pituitary gland and then growth hormone travels to the bones where it triggers bone growth. Psychosocial dwarfism is a failure to grow which is caused by stress early in life. And the somatomedins 
are, are hormones that normally aid growth, um, and they're released by the liver in response to growth hormone. And, uh, it, research shows that stress and sleep deprivation can interfere with growth hormone release and its normal effects on growth. Finally, the sex hormones. So the gonads, ovaries, and testes produce sex hormones, and uh, the hypothalamus controls gonadal hormone production by releasing gonadotropin releasing hormones. And uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone stimulates the anterior pituitary to release follicle stimulating hormone or luteinizing hormone. Now, the testes produce and secrete testosterone, one of the male hormones called androgens. And testosterone is regulated by luteinizing hormone, which is regulated by gonadotropin releasing hormone. Now, melatonin. Um, the pineal gland, and you see the pineal gland over here um, in white. Um, this one's slightly enlarged here. Um, the pineal gland secretes melatonin, mostly at night, which then provides a signal that tracks day length and the seasons. And it's been implicated in sleep cycles as well as mood disorders. Um, now, endocrine pathology can resemble psychiatric disorders. One type of uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder involves decreased sensitivity to thyroid hormone. Um, another finding is that Cushing's disease, result, which results from long-term excess of glucocorticoids um, uh, with symptoms of fatigue and depression. And the hormonal and neural systems exert reciprocal influences on each other. Um, experience affect hor affects hormone secretion and hormones affect behavior, and uh, behavior then affects future experiences. Um, so I would like to thank you um, for, for watching my, my video here, uh, my presentation for um, hormones in the brain. And uh, the next topic that I would like to discuss with you in my, in my next lecture is going to be uh, the relationship between evolution behavior in the brain. Thank you so much.